Hi guys, what is up and welcome back to another video. Today you join me in the Cupra 4Mentor e-Hybrid. This is the 245 version, so underneath it is effectively the same as a Golf GTE. Now, when I attended the Cupra Press event a few months back to have a look at the new Leon Cupra, um, I was very interested to check out the petrol variant, so I checked out the Leon 300 and also the 4Mentor 310 4 drive. But something else that really interested me was the e-hybrid because there's a lot of purists who say that hybrid cars cannot be fun, they cannot be sporty, and a hybrid does not belong in a Cupra. So I reached out to the Cupra press team and I said to them, look, a lot of people aren't too sure about the hybrid thing. So I want to have a go in one and treat it as my daily driver to see exactly what it's all about. And to my surprise, they chucked me the keys and said, you can drive this one for a week and see what you think. So when you first start up, it's gonna to default to fully electric mode. And let's give it a quite instant talk. Very quiet, very subtle. And you'll get sort of 33, 34 miles out of the electric range. Yeah, it does have some, it does have some pull in fully electric mode. I mean, it's definitely not gonna set your world on fire, but that sound combined with the instant talk is pretty awesome. Now, of course, 30 odd miles of range isn't an awful lot, but you've got to consider that this is a plug-in hybrid. It's designed, realistically, to be charged overnight. Now, charging via your normal three pin mains plug will take around six to six and a half hours. So it's definitely best done overnight. And even via the normal type two fast chargers, it's still gonna take over three and a half hours. So it's definitely not ideal if you're in a situation where you really need long range electricity. That This isn't the car for that. This is designed to do the best of both worlds. So the other mode you can set it to is hybrid. And once you set it to hybrid, it will utilize the full 245 horsepower. And you can hear the engine kick in, but it doesn't do it in too much of a rough way. Now the engine is a 1.4 TSI and it produces around 150 horsepower. So you can see the kind of split of the different drivetrains. Now, the thing is with the 1.4 turbo is in a car this size with a curb weight of around 1700 kilos, it is certainly that little bit rough uh, in terms of its sound. Uh, and also you really have to ring it out to get the best of it. So you can hear when the engine kicks in, it does sound a little bit rough. Um, it's quite low revving as well. It only goes up to sort of six, six and a half K as the red line. First of all, let's talk styling. As I say, I've got a previous video on the Formentor, but let's just go over it again. The styling, I think, is absolutely spot on. I actually think in terms of styling, looking at it, it's got hints of Lamborghini Urus about it. There's something about the shape of it, the way the back slopes down and the way the sharp lines run down the side of the car to a point at the front where that dominating Cupra badge sits. And it just has some real road presence about it, especially in this amazing magnetic gray finish. I thought it looked cool when I first saw it, but it's only driving one every day that you really appreciate how good it actually looks. People stare at it everywhere you go, it's crazy. I've got a new neighbor who's got two young boys. And when I was coming out in this this morning, I drove past them and they were playing out in their front garden. Their dad has a pretty high-end BMW 5 Series, an F10, um, all done up, modified, really nice car. And as I drove past, one of the kids went, wow, cool car, man. I mean, that says it all, right? That's the sort of thing that I would have said when I was a kid and not for any car either. Right, so I'm about to pull out of a junction and I'm in hybrid mode. So I'm gonna put my foot right to the floor. Bit of wheel spin there. I've got the boost active and that's 60 there. Not bad. I mean, not to 60 is achieved in around seven seconds in this car, which is around two seconds slower than that of the 310 four drive model. This would definitely benefit from four wheel drive, but obviously that adds weight and that would be a reduction in space in the boot as well. So this particular model has 345 litres of boot space, which of course you're gonna get more out of a wagon, but your grand's gonna get in and out of this easier because it's a little bit taller. It's gonna be more practical for getting a child seat in and out of, and you've got definitely some more headroom in here and a little bit more legroom than the equivalent Leon. There's just something about it really sets it apart from its rivals. This particular one I'm sitting in here is around 40 grand, just a hair over. You can get four into starting from around 27, 28, but you don't really want one of those because even though they're quite a generous specification from factory in the base trim, what you will find is that 
the engine choices at that level are a bit all show and no go. So your day-to-day -day stuff then, interior quality is a massive step up from before. You do still get some scratchy plastics down low, but that's to be expected in this class of car. In terms of the actual steering wheel, I absolutely love the new steering wheel. I think it looks great. I think these illuminated controls are really useful. It's nice to still have some physical buttons um, and also the paddles are much improved on the previous generation cars as well. In terms of your infotainment, the maps are much improved. You've got logos for fuel stations. Everything looks a little bit cleaner. Your traffic sign recognition is great. It'll pop up with the speed limit on the actual speedo dial, which is really useful at a glance. It shows you all of your hybrid stuff and this massive screen is brilliant. Um, it's definitely an improvement over the previous gen. I've still experienced some lag here and there, but it has improved since the last one I drove, which I imagine is probably down to software updates. Um, but all the menus are pretty easy to navigate. The only thing I really don't like is the climate controls because they're all touch, even the temperature sliders, they're all touch. And inside the menus, they're a little bit fiddly. There's no just off button. You have to fiddle about with some menus. If you take your eyes off the road for too long, it is literally all touch based. There's no click wheel or anything else to control it. So if I spend too long fiddling about with this climate control menu, I will veer off the road, hit a tree and be killed. Aside from that though, really impressed with the whole system. A big step up on what was there before. Uh, this screen is bigger than the one you get in the lay on and I think it does look more upmarket for it and it does make navigation that a little bit easier as well. And of course, you've got loads of control in there for stuff like ambient lighting of a nighttime, which does look awesome in here. It's a little bit distracting your line of sight where it's placed on the dash, but really nice. It makes it a much nicer place to be. And I'm also really keen on these touch lights up here, which are basically one piece of acrylic, which you just press and it's a touch sensitive control to turn the spotlights on and off. You even get illuminated USB-C sockets. It's all quite modern and you've got a nice wireless charging dock down there as well. I would definitely recommend going for the higher spec cars like this VZ2, which come with these really nice leather bucket seats finished in the nice Nappa leather with the contrast stitching. It really, really suits the cabin and they're quite plush, very electrically adjustable as well. Uh, heated steering wheel and lots of other extra bits and bobs. Although the kind of entry level V1 and V2 cars are actually pretty generously specced. But enough about all of the practical stuff, right? You know what the Four Mentor is by this point. You've probably seen other reviews. And as I say, on my channel, I've got an in-depth review as well of all the practicalities of the car. What I'm mainly here to talk about today is this drivetrain. So pretty much lifted straight out of the Golf GTE. Does it actually suit a Cupra? And more to the point, does it suit a 1700 kilo small SUV like this? First and foremost, what I want to say is I love the way this chassis feels. Um, I said it in my Form Enter 310 video, it's just really dialed in. For the size of the car, I was expecting lots of body roll, but you know, here I am, I'm about to take quite a tight roundabout. Um, you know, I can, I can feel the weight of the car, but it does stay pretty flat. And then if I chuck it the other way, easy. It just handles it, it feels almost hot hatch. Now at 245 brake, and of course you've got the opportunity to reduce that to almost 150 when the battery runs flat, this is definitely more warm hatch than hot hatch. If you really want hot hatch territory, the 310 four drive is the car to go for, and trust me, that is brilliant. Maybe best in class. But I am really impressed with the way this feels. Um, there is an ever so slight delay to the steering, even with lane assist and all that turned off but it's not too dramatic. It still corners pretty flat for the size of the car. It still feels really nice under load as well when you're taking harsh corners. Um, LSD, great. You've got lots and lots of stuff to make sure that this still feels like a Cupra. Suspension is nicer than in the Leon as well. I mean, it's obviously not quite as firm. It's obviously not quite as tight in the corners. However, McPherson struts at the front, multi-link at the rear. It still feels really dialed in in the bends. And not only that, but it does ride pretty well as well, considering the low profile tires on this car. So here we are passing a petrol station because I don't need to stop because this thing is actually great on fuel. Now, WLTP says 176 mile per gallon. So let's talk about that, shall we? So what I've actually been averaging in this with the same driving as I would in my Leon Cupra, which is the normal 290 petrol, I would normally get in that car around 32, 33 mile per gallon average with the mixed driving that I do. In this, I've been getting around 100 miles per gallon if it's plugged in and charged. So let's be honest, really impressive figures, but only impressive if you keep it topped up. 
So if you're in the kind of battery reserve mode trying to self-charge the car, or you've run out of battery, it's gonna just utilize the 150 horsepower 1.4 TSI engine, which obviously is a lot more sluggish without that torque boost from the electric motors. And obviously it's gonna be a lot less efficient than with the electric motors as well. So on a sort of half an hour, 40 minute drive with just the petrol engine, I managed to achieve around 36 to 37 miles per gallon. So it's still not terrible, but obviously that is way off the combined uh, MPG. But the drivetrain, let's get back to the drivetrain. Can this car still be sporty with that drivetrain? Well, at the moment, I'm starting to run low on battery, so soon I'll be in a situation where I lose a lot of the power of the car. But currently, I'm in hybrid mode and it's switching between the two and it gives me that boost of energy with the electric drive when I put my foot right to the floor. So, I can see boost come up there and you felt the engine come in and you can hear the engine struggle under high load. And that's the interesting thing about it. You can hear it kind of struggling, but you're pushed back in your seat, which feels really odd, but you realize soon that that is the electric motor doing the job. So when the electric drive runs out of charge, it does feel a little bit strained under load, but it's by no means sluggish, you know. I mean, it's definitely not gonna keep up with proper hot hatches, but it's not a slow car. It's, it still feels adequate for the size that it is. If you want true performance, of course, you just have to go with the petrol variant. You have to go for the 310 four drive. It's a lot quicker in a straight line, you know, two seconds quicker to 60. And then you've got that electronically limited top speed of 155, whereas this will top out at 130. It definitely sounds a lot better than this. In Cupra mode, if I switch to Cupra mode now, you'll start to hear some artificial noise pumped in. And Cupra mode stiffens the suspension with the dynamic chassis control. So in Cupra mode, it handles the twisty stuff a lot better because it does stiffen up. Interestingly, in Cupra mode, the throttle response changes drastically, and that is down to the regen braking. Now, in Cupra mode, the regen braking kicks in a lot more thoroughly, so it's almost more like an electric car. When you lift off, it starts to auto brake, whereas in comfort mode, it handles more like a normal car where you can just accelerate and brake as normal. But in Cupra mode, the throttle response is definitely improved. It just feels sharper. It, it gives you that quicker burst of torque. You could see me being pushed back a little bit in my seat there. I don't even mind the artificial noise pumped in that much. It's not too bad at all. It feels a lot quicker than it is just because of that instant torque from the electric motor. So long as you keep this thing charged up, you could have a lot of fun with it in Cupra mode. It still handles really well. It doesn't feel like a boat at all. And in Cupra mode with the dynamic chassis control, it really firms up and it really makes things a lot stiffer for when you're tuckling the harsh bends. You know, it feels really dialed in for the size of car that it is. I'm just, I was so impressed with this, with the 310 four drive version. And this feels exactly the same. In terms of the way the chassis handles and feels, it still feels absolutely fantastic. Right, so 50 mile an hour, let's just stick my foot down. It took a second to think about it, but then all of a sudden it picks up and you get that hybrid boost and it really shoves you back. It feels quicker than it is, but you can hear that engine struggling slightly. Something I don't like about this as well is it's got that fake rear diffuser exhaust situation, which you get the quad exhaust on the petrol version, which I much, much prefer. So the other thing with regards to the battery manager is you could tweak it yourself to kind of get the best of both worlds. So you can put it into an individual setting and set the battery reserve. So if you set it to sort of 20, 30%, it will try and recharge the battery to that using the self-charging methods of regen braking and that kind of thing. But also it will try and use the hybrid drive where necessary to provide the performance boost. If you put it right up to 100%, it's gonna basically switch off the hybrid drive for the most part and utilize mostly the petrol engine, which obviously is the least efficient way of doing things and the slowest. So who is this car for? Well. 10% benefit in kind for business users. So there you go, that's gonna make a big difference for some people. If you're the sort of person who wants a family car that's not too big, then this is the sort of class of car you're looking at. You're looking at stuff like this, and you're looking at stuff like the Audi Q3, uh, Volkswagen uh, T-Cross or Tiguan, that kind of thing. If you're the sort of person who plugs a car in overnight on the drive, you know, if you've got a charger installed in your house, or if you're just gonna use the plug in a garage, you've got a driveway, then this is a great car for you. 
if you're the sort of person who lives in terraced housing, you've not got parking outside your house, then it's gonna be practically useless because you can't really charge it up at a garage. It's gonna take over three hours. And you know, unless you've got somewhere to charge it at home, you're not gonna utilize the benefits of the car. You might as well have just gone for a normal petrol one effectively. And if you're just using the petrol drive on its own, as I say, I've been achieving sort of 35 to 40 mile per gallon at best without using the electric motors. And to be honest, that's not that far off what I'm getting if I'm sensible in my petrol Cupra, which has over double the power of the petrol engine in this. So really, it wouldn't make any sense unless you can charge it overnight all the time. So guys, there we have it, the Cupra Formentor e-hybrid. Now I totally get it. If you're the sort of person who wants to enjoy a really sporty hot hatch, then a hybrid isn't really gonna be for you. But this is one of the best compromises that you're gonna get in terms of performance and economy in this price range and also in this class of car, I feel. If you're not quite ready to go all electric, or you don't have the capacity to charge, or you're worried about range anxiety, you know, once the electric charge runs out in this, you've got the petrol engine, it's gonna be fine. It gives you a little bit of sophistication around town when I'm sitting in traffic like this and I'm silently whirring away with the electric motor. I've got the torque to just give it a bit of shove off the line away from the lights, but I'm not using the petrol engine, so I'm being really efficient. And then when you get out on the twisty stuff, you can put it in Cupra mode, utilize that boost, and utilize the petrol engine for that hybrid drive. Or on longer journeys, if it's set to do the battery reserve, you could get the best of both worlds for a fair period of time with reasonable economy. So overall then, what do I think? Well, I would say my pick of the range for the Formentor will still be the 300 four drive. It is just the more involving driver's car and it is obviously much faster. However, if you've got the ability to plug this in at home every night and you want a quick-ish family car that looks the part, well equipped, something a little bit different, and you know, just an, just a great all-rounder. Then it definitely will suit a lot of people. Um, you want to save a bit of money on fuel. This isn't going to get those quoted figures unless you really drive it like sensibly crazy and keep it charged all the time. But it's still going to be a lot more efficient than a normal petrol Cupra. And I think it is still fun thanks to this amazing chassis on the Formentor. And let's be honest, the future is electric and I know it's a little bit scary, but this is like dipping your toes in without actually going too far. You, you're not going head first into electric with this. It's like dabbling in both worlds. And look at all the great stuff coming out of electric. The Porsche Taycan, the Tesla Model S, the Rimac Nevera, really exciting cars that are only gonna propel us forward into more petrol heads involving electric. So overall, I do think this is worthy of the Cupra badge. It's just not for everyone. So consider that when making your choice. The petrol one isn't that much different in price to this one when you spec it up. So it really is down to preference, maybe a few grand in it if you go for the top spec one. But you know, most of these are gonna be done on PCP or lease deals. You're not gonna notice an awful lot of difference in pricing. So once again, thank you so much for Cooper and Media UK for allowing me access to this car for the week to daily to give you guys some real insight as to what it's actually been performing like for me. Plenty more to come, so I'll see you in the next one.